اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ بار الخلائق الاجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء حبیب قلوبنا وشفیع ذنوبنا ابی القاسم محمد اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ محمد و علی محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب العمر والزمان روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين رب العالمين اما بعد قال اللہ تعالی فی محکم کتابه الحکیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان اللہ استفا آدم و نوحا و آل ابراہیم و آل عمران علی العالمین صدق اللہ العلی العظیم و آمنا به نورو مجالسکم بذکر محمد و آل محمد I would like to begin tonight's lecture first and foremost by thanking the organizers of this majlis in this Husseiniya al-Mubaraka, Husseiniya Diwan al-Kafil. And I would like to thank each and every one of you who have made an effort and taken time out of your Friday night to come and honor the seventh divinely chosen successor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And to be very honest with you, it brings me great pleasure. And for me it is a source of happiness that the Shabaab who have got here together have taken an effort to commemorate the istishad, the martyrdom of Imam Al-Qadim for three nights. And this in itself is a commendable effort at a time where the level of religiosity amongst the Shia youth is declining on one hand. On the other hand, at a time where Babu al-Hawaij, Imam al-Kadhim is not given the due respect that is deserved leave by the outsiders but those who claim to be from the Shia of Imam al-Kadhim. And you find this within our centers, you find this within our mosques that when it comes to commemorating the istishad of Imam al-Kadhim Generally speaking, the presence and the audience and the hudur is very, very small compared to what it actually should be. For intum ahibai who come out of your way to uphold the dhikr of Imam al-Kadhim, inshaAllah this is recorded in your book of deeds. And the qasam by the member of Imam al Hussein before you leave this place which is Mubarak, this daftar in which your name is recorded in having played a part of ensuring the commemoration of Imam al-Kadhim and the legacy of Imam al-Kadhim remains alive, reaches Imam al-Kadhim himself. And this truly is a tawfiq from Allah Azza wa Jal. And the particular sort of lutuf bestowed upon you by Imam al-Kadhim himself and I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that over these nights, inshaAllah, whatever desires you may have, may they be fulfilled by the sake of Babul Hawaij, Imam Al Kadhim. Whatever difficulties you may have, may they be solved for you and may they be made easy for you again by the grace of Babul Hawaij, Imam Al Kadhim, and all of this with the barakat of Allah, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
for the next two nights taban this is a three night program and inshallah i shall be at your service for tonight and tomorrow the idea is that over these two nights inshallah to understand imam al kadhim we shall embark upon a journey a two part series and inshallah it is a series that is qurani akhlaqi aqaidi tarikhi inshallah motivational from every perspective and the idea is to use the quran as a manhaj to understand imam al kadhim for we have this eternal saying of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam where he says inni tarikun fikum muthiqlain kitabullah wa itrati ahla bayti ma in tamassaktum bihima lan tadhillu ba'di abada i leave behind for you two weighty things so long as you hold on to them you shall never go astray the quran and the itra and you find that between the amma and the khassa this hadith that says kitabullah wa itrati is what is mashhoor in this day and age holding on to this hadith is of absolute importance because you find the rasulullah says lan tadhillu ba'di abada this particle of negation in arabic language lam nun lan tadhillu lam nun denotes fi'l yani fi'l mudhari' for now lil hadir wa lil mustaqbal for now and for the future yani up to the zuhur of the 12th imam and the awaited savior of mankind ajallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif in this storm of ideology which we are surrounded by in this طوفان of fasad which we are surrounded by confusion in the religion as to what is the true path habibi your salvation is the quran and the ahlul bayt and it is this hadith that we need to engrave in our minds and in our hearts and every drop of blood that flows through our veins should be holding this hadith if and only if you aspire to be from those awaited 313 and i say awaited 313 because in the same way that we are waiting for the zuhur of the imam the imam is also waiting for us to bring ourselves up to a level where we are now deserving to be of that leadership for the lecture for tonight from the quran and i don't want to give away inshallah the beauty hopefully it's beautiful i don't want to give away the beauty of the introduction without reciting the verse of the quran for the surah of the quran that we have chosen is surah al yusuf and you find over here in verse number 3 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says bismillahir rahmanir rahim nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al qasas bima awhayna ilayka hadha al quran وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ We want to tie this lecture lecture Imam Al-Kadhim The verse of the Quran that we are choosing or the surah from the Quran the chapter of the Quran that we are selecting Surah Al-Yusuf Look at what Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says and we narrate to you the best of stories that has been revealed through this quran historical events the most inspiring events that have taken place in the course of human history allah azza wa jal has narrated them for us through this revelation within the quran why does allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make parables and refer back to history within the quran 
there has to be a reason for mentioning, if I can use this word, stories of the past. There are many events in our life that we can relate to that actually took part in the past. History repeats itself. And there are many challenges that we face today in our lives. The solution is in the Quran and in the actions of the Salihin and the Anbiya and the Awsiya in the past. They face the same challenges as us. Maybe just the colors and the shapes of these challenges differ. But the essence is the same. And from here we open the bahath over the next two nights. Ya ahibai, inside of human history we have two individuals who were made prisoners by the tyrants of their time. Two individuals on the face of this earth, on the face of this earth for whom there is absolutely no parallel. You have this one wali, you have this one nabi from the anbiya of Allah Azza wa Jal by the name of Nabi Yusuf, who was a prisoner of the tyrant of his time. And you have Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al Kadhim, who was also a prisoner of the tyrant of his time. And the bahath over these two nights is to draw a comparison and mukarana between this prisoner Nabi Yusuf and this prisoner Imam Musa al kadhim And the idea is to be able to understand the azamah, the greatness and the divinity associated to Imam Musa al kadhim through Surah Al-Yusuf. And the Wallahi Al-Azim, it is as if this entire Surah Al-Yusuf, hundred odd verses, kalima kalima, word by word of this entire chapter, is a narrative of the fada'il and the life and the merits of Imam Musa al kadhim For the idea is that we embark upon a journey where we understand the greatness of Imam al kadhim through Surah Al-Yusuf in comparison with the imprisonment of Nabi Yusuf and the imprisonment of Nabi or Imam Musa al kadhim For you find that one of the best ways to understand Ahlul Bayt is through the Quran. And you find from here a rule of thumb that will change your perspective in terms of understanding Tashayyuh and Ahlul Bayt altogether. And this is from the secrets of the Quran in that Allah Azza wa Jal has placed the similitude and the greatness of Ahlul Bayt within the stories of the Anbiya of the past. Such that when you recite Surah Al-Yusuf and when you listen to the story of Nabi Yusuf and you have inside of your mind that they lived once upon a time a Nabi from the Anbiya of Allah who was persecuted within a prison you carry this message forward and you see that Allah Azza wa Jal even in our time gave us a Yusuf the Yusuf of Ali Muhammad which is Imam al kadhim understand the Yusuf of Ali Muhammad through this verse that talks about that Yusuf the son of Yaqub inshallah you are with me this is a Brand new perspective in understanding Imam al kadhim For insha'Allah, tonight, a few comparisons between the situation or the circumstances of Nabi Yusuf and the circumstances of Imam al kadhim And tomorrow night, insha'Allah, we shall go into further detail comparing the circumstances of the imprisonment of Nabi Yusuf and then comparing that with the circumstances of the imprisonment of Imam al-Kadhim. 
For tomorrow's lecture, khasatan is the tarkiz on the imprisonment. Today we have certain aspects in terms of fada'il and history that are mushtarakat. We will take them from the Quran. For Inta, ya Habibi, when you read through the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to you, we narrate to you stories of the past. The idea is to use these stories of the past and relate them to your present times. Take the stories of the past anbiya and use them to understand the imams of your time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to mention Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is verse number four. إِذْ قَالَ يُوسُفْ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَتِي إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَحَدَ عَشَرَ كَوْكَبًا وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ رَأَيْتُهُمْ لِي سَاجِدِينَ Nabi Yusuf says to his father, O oh my father, I show in a dream that the eleven planets or stars, however you want to translate it, Eleven planets together with the moon and the sun are prostrating in front of me. Taban, when you refer back to the tafasi, mufassirin of the Quran, this dream was actually a glad tiding from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informing Nabi Yusuf. Of his future position as a Nabi from the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who shall command authority over everybody. And the fact that he commands authority over the entire khalq, hence the expression, رَأَيْتُهُمْ لِي سَاجِدِينَ Yani they submit to his authority. Tayyib, Nabi Yusuf is explaining to his father this dream which is a glad tiding of his prophecy. You, Nabi Yusuf, are going to be a grand Nabi from the Anbiya of Allah. What was the reaction of his father? And this is the point. Nabi Yaqub says to his son Yusuf alayhi salam, he says, O oh my son, do not narrate this dream, do not narrate this glad tiding for your brothers, because indeed they will plot against you. They shall plot against you and indeed shaitan is the greatest enemy. So what happens over here is that Nabi Yaqub tells Nabi Yusuf, do not publicize the fact that you are going to be a prophet from the prophets of Allah because your brothers shall plot against you. Why will your brothers plot against you? Jealousy. And indeed, shaitan is the greatest enemy. So Nabi Yaqub says to Nabi Yusuf, keep secret this glad tidings because if your brothers were to find out how Allah Azza wa Jal has selected you and preferred you over your brothers, you will be a victim of their hate and a victim of their jealousy. Bain al Kausain. Dars akhlaqi. Ya ahibai, the most toxic sin and the most toxic trait that a human being can have is the trait of jealousy. The brothers of Nabi Yusuf threw him in a well and abandoned him inside of the well. Because of this jealousy that Yusuf commanded or Yusuf attracted the most love and the most attention from his father. In addition to the fact of the father's fear that if the brothers were to know he's a Nabi from the Anbiya and they were not cho chosen, it would increase in this jealousy and hatred. The beginning emotion that led the brothers to act in this way with Nabi Yusuf, throw him into a well and abandon him for God knows what. This act of hostility and enmity 
What triggered this behavior? What triggers such emotions within a person? Jealousy. Jealousy has no bounds. Jealousy removes a human being from within the parameters of sanity. The first ever sin to be committed was the sin of jealousy. Look at what eventually made Iblis to be thrown out from the heavens and to become this eternally condemned being. Jealousy. Jealousy on one side, ego on another side. How can I prostrate in front of somebody made of clay and I am made of fire? This is ego. But on the other hand, you also have hadith of Ahlul Bayt that it was jealousy that triggered Iblis's revolt against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is it when Allah azza wa jal said, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. How is it that Adam is that khalifa and I am not that khalifa? After all my worship and all my prostrations and bowings in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is it this being made of clay just the other day, if we could say, how is it that he becomes the Khalifa of Allah while I, the grand worshipper, does not get this position, this jealousy led Iblis to his actions. And hence it's important for us when it comes to tazkiyah to nafs that we learn to get rid and purify our hearts from traits like hasad many times even you have amongst those people who say they work for the deen <coughs> they work for the deen and they want to serve ahlul bayt and they serve ahlul bayt but what ends up happening is that we begin to is destroy and attack each other to a great extent because of ego, to a great extent because of jealousy. Sahih Lola or I live in a different alam. These are things that we see on a daily basis. For this is one lesson that we need to take as we pursue this journey of self-perfection. That we cleanse our hearts from jealousy. Positive traits, achievements, blessings that other people have. Appreciate that. Pray for them that they have more. And pray for Allah to give you the same. Which is why we have within our hadith that enter yourself when you have a supplication to make to Allah Azza wa Jal. Before you ask for anything for yourself. Ask for the goodness of your brothers and your neighbors. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ask for your brothers, their supplications, their needs to be fulfilled. And if you do that before you ask for yours, I guarantee you the fulfillment of your needs. This is not only to be viewed in terms of adab and akhlaq of ad'iyah, of supplicating to Allah. But it's to show you that there is a deep intrinsic lesson that we, we are supposed to embrace. And that is engraving within ourselves, inculcating within ourselves a culture of loving for others what you love for yourself. Despise for others what you despise for yourself. Ani, I don't like anyone to backbite about me. Hence, I need to refrain from backbiting against others. As simple as. For you find, if we come back to our point, Mukarana, comparing between the situation of Nabi Yusuf and Imam al Qadim alayhi salam. Prisoner Nabi Yusuf and prisoner Imam al Qadim. Nabi Yusuf was imprisoned. Or Nabi Yusuf was thrown into a well by his brothers. And was the subject of hate due to jealousy from the side of his brother. 
And in the same way, when you come to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Qadim alayhi salam, he was the subject of persecution and imprisonment for a great, to a great extent because of the jealousy that Bani Abbas, his own cousins, harbored against him. Nabi Yusuf was thrown into the well by his own blood brothers. Imam al-Qadim alayhi salam was imprisoned also by his own relatives. Bani Abbas, Minu. Bani Abbas, yani the lineage that came from Abbas, the uncle of the Holy Prophet. In fact, Bani Abbas played a crucial role and spearheaded the revolution to overthrow Bani Umayyah. And their slogan at the beginning of the revolution was Ya Nitharat al Hussein. They came into power with the slogan seeking vengeance for Imam al Hussein to return power and to return leadership back to Ahlul Bayt. The children from the lineage of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But power and dunya, materialistic possession is such. That as soon as they overthrew Bani Umayyah and came into power, they oppressed the same Imams who they claimed to have been helping all this time. And hence, you find this reluctance from the side of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq to support these revolutions that took place. A number of them to overthrow Bani Umayyah. Because what happened essentially was the replacement of one dictator with another dictator. And history could go on and on and on as to who was more brutal than the other. But this is the first point of comparison. Like the way Nabi Yusuf was the subject of hate because of jealousy from his brothers. Imam Al-Kadhim was also the subject of hate due to jealousy from his cousins. This Bani Abbas was the lineage that comes from the children of the uncle of the Holy Prophet Abbas. In fact, they could not stand... The superiority of the children from Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib and the children of the Sada from Imam Hassan and Hussein. They could not stand them. And they felt that due to their position as children from the uncle of the Holy Prophet, that they also had in a share in the superiority within Islam to lead the Ummah. Whereas Allah Azza wa Jal had never decreed for this position of Imama to be in any other lineage except within the lineage of Amirul Mu'mineen and Sayyidat Nisa al Alamin, returning back to the lineage of Rasulullah. And you find that this evident jealousy which then transpired into hate and into persecution and bloodshed. You find this evident within the dialogues of Bani Abbas with the Imams. If I'm not mistaken, it might be with Imam Al-Qadim or with Imam Ridha. One of them, where either Ma'mun or Harun, it slips my mind whether it was Imam Al-Qadim or Imam Ridha. In any case, both of them successors of Rasulullah. They are in the court and they are summoned by the leader of Bani Abbas. The so-called caliph says to the imam, and what makes you most superior to us in regards to your relationship with Rasulullah? Just like the way you were the children of Fatima, the daughter of Rasulullah, we are the children of the uncle Abbas of Rasulullah. Like the way your grandmother is the daughter of Rasulullah, our grandfathers, the uncle of the Holy Prophet Abbas and the father of the Holy Prophet shared the same grandfather. So what gives you the right to be more superior than us? What makes you more closer to Rasulullah than us? Look at the question. Ma'asum Imam, either Al-Qadim or Ridha. Look at the answer. He's in the courtyard. And he says to the ruler from Bani Abbas, he says to him, if you had a daughter 
Would you give the hand of your daughter to Rasulullah in marriage? Caliph looked at him, surprised. He said, of course I would give him. This would be fakhr for me. It would be a point of honor that I further strengthen the relationship and make the relationship closer with Rasulullah by having one of my daughters marry him because marriage amongst the daughters, amongst the cousins is acceptable. He said, of course I would do that. Masum Imam says, this is the difference between us and you. And this is the difference in the proximity between us and you in regards to Rasulullah. When you come to, when it comes to your daughters, you would give your daughter, your daughter's hand to Rasulullah out of marriage in order to gain proximity. But for us, we cannot give our daughters to Rasulullah in marriage because we are direct grandchildren from Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And it is through dialogues like these that you find in history that this hate was eminent in regards to Imam al qadim subjected to him by his own relatives. This is point number one. Comparison number one. Number two. Continuing on. Verse number six. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa kathalika Yajtabika Rabbuka. He's talking in reference, Allah Azza wa Jalla is talking in reference to Nabi Yusuf. And this is how we selected you. Wakadalika Yajtabika Rabbuka. Ijtiba, istifa, yani selected by, purified, selected by Allah. And over here there is nukta muhimma that guides, divine guides are selected by Allah Azza wa Jal. Regardless of whether you're a Nabi or regardless of whether you're an Imam. Because the Nabi and the Imam with the differences that they have in their positions, they also have similarities. The Nabi and the Imam, regardless of the differences in their position, both of them have one thing in common. And that common denominator is that they are the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, from these three words in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is how we select our representatives. And this is a lesson which is absolutely important in tarikh. Had this lesson been understood, has these verses of the Quran been understood, the Muslim Ummah would not be in the sorry state that it has been over the last 1400 years. Can an Imam be selected by the masses through election or is he selected by Allah Azza wa Jal? The Imam, like the Nabi, is a representative of Allah. And the function of the Imam, like a Nabi, is to guide the masses. Teach them, educate them, and ensure that the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah are preserved. This representative, whose function is this, does it make sense that the masses select him? Or does it make sense that Allah should select him? Who has the right to select the representative of Allah? I talk to you with mantik, yani logic, something simplistic logic. Arrangement of arguments. Sogra kubra natija. And I'm sure most of you have studied basic logic within school. The arrangement of arguments or the premise of an argument in order to deduce a conclusion in the right manner. Yabe, you have a representative of Allah. Imagine this situation. Ani, we get together over here, all of us, and we decide to select Haji Fulan, Haji Ali. 
and we impose upon Allah, Ya Allah, from today, Haji Fulan is going to be your representative. If you want to communicate with us, communicate to us through him. Does it make sense? This actually leads towards kufr because you are trying to impose your choice upon Allah. Allah is telling you, I'm going to give you my representative who's going to convey my message to you and teach you the religion which is emanating from me. I turn around and I say, Allah, Ya Allah, you can't choose. We will sit together in an election. We will choose the representative and you have to accept him. Now we're going to salati ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Salaam alaikum. Does it make sense that you impose your choice of a Nabi? Have you read anywhere in history that a community got together and said, Yalla, we choose Fulan to be the Nabi and let him go and get the Wahi? Abadan la. And similarly with the successor of the Prophet, have we found anywhere in history that the community got together and selected the successor of the Prophet? When it came to Harun, you have the hadith. Anta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa. This is a hadith, yani ittifaq. There is ittifaq on this hadith between the Amm and the Khasa. Wa usikum wa usi nafsi. I advise you and I advise myself on a very humble basis, Shabab Peshawar Nights. Peshawar Nights is a book which is absolutely beautiful in its islub, in its style of debating. Leave debating, Baba, in terms of understanding your own faith. Understanding your own faith from the books of those who may not share the same belief as you in a manner that is logical, in a manner that is non-violent, in a manner silmi. You have this. We have to be educated. We have to be from those people who are eloquent in their speech when it comes to representing Ahlul Bayt. Because violence is the tool of the one who has no mantik, who has no logic. Enter you're the follower of Amirul Mu'mineen. His compilation, what was found by Sayyid Radi, rightfully titled Nahjul Balagha, the peak of eloquence. Then what about us, the followers and the Shia of Amirul Mu'mineen? We also need to nurture within ourselves the skill of eloquence when it comes to speaking with ourselves, amongst ourselves, and with others. Fa. In any case, you find that you never have in history Harun. Rasulullah says in regards to Amir al you are to me like the way Harun was to Musa. If I ask you, refer back to history. Whether you find even one history book, leave the books of the Muslimin. Whether you will find this in the books of the Christians or in the books of the Jews, was Harun selected by Bani Israel or selected by Allah? Find me one person who is born in history till today who said Harun was selected by the community. Abadan la. So then why the exception when it comes to the successor of Rasulullah? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Same thing. Imam al qadim Selected by Allah Azza wa Jal. And just like the way the people couldn't digest the fact that Amir al muminin was selected by Allah, this jealousy which then transpired into hate traveled down the generations. It all comes back to this one point, jealousy, a core trait of Iblis. In any case, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ See, I buy kalima kalima from the verses of the Quran and you have oceans of buhuth that open up hundred odd verses we have in all of these in surah al yusuf from the fada'il wallah from the fada'il of imam al qadim he goes on to say wa kadhalika yajtabika rabbuka wa yu'allimuka min ta'wil al ahadith in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting one of the khususiyat of Nabi Yusuf. 
Shabab, we don't lose track of our bigger picture and our bahath, mukarana, comparison between Nabi Yusuf and Imam al Qadim using Surah Al Yusuf. Over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing Nabi Yusuf to the Muslimin. He is introducing Nabi Yusuf to the world, Allah Azza wa Jal. And when he introduces Nabi Yusuf, he introduces him by mentioning one of his khususiyat. Yani he mentions this one attribute. Allah introduces Azza wa Jal, Nabi Yusuf to the world. By mentioning one of his attributes, enter when you want to introduce somebody, you want to make an introduction, you're going to mention one attribute that stands out in him. Something that he's known for. The same thing into Ahibai when you're writing your CVs and you are applying for jobs, inshallah each and every one of you is blessed with the best of jobs in the dunya and you use it to gain the highest level in the akhirah as well inshallah. When you're writing your CV, you will mention the best points of your education or your achievements. Something that distinguishes you from the rest. Sahilala is an introduction. You want to be recognized. You want to introduce yourself. For using the same logic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing Nabi Yusuf to the world through the Quran. So he selects this one attribute of Nabi Yusuf through which he stands out. All the Anbiya are muqaddas. But he uses this one, Allah Azza wa Jal. How does he introduce Nabi Yusuf? He says to him, وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِن تَعْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ A hadith over here, dreams. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing Nabi Yusuf and the superiority of Nabi Yusuf by saying that we have given him the knowledge of the interpretation of dreams. This is what Nabi Yusuf was known for. He was able to interpret the dreams with all its hidden meanings and its symbolisms. Ya ahibai, dreams is an entire science, the science of understanding dreams, ilmul manam. And you have a number of books that are written in regards to whether identifying whether you have a ru'ya sadika or ru'ya kadiba. If you see kada kada in your dream, it means so on so forth. If you see that, it means that. If you see this, it means this. Hadith of Ahlul Bayt. So don't discount some of the dreams that you may have or some of the dreams that are mentioned within the Quran. Especially when it comes to certain events of Ahlul Bayt. La. Many times it's easy. Many times, I'm not making generalization, huh? Or a certain target, law, generally. Many times we tend to think if the khatib mentions from the member a certain dream, these are from the khurafat, la baba. Not necessarily. We have an ilm which is daqiq and everything has a mizan. Some things that are accurate, some things that are not. Obviously the manam, the dreams is not a hujja, according to all of the present manaja, at least from that which I'm aware of. And that's a bahath on its own. There are those who said, no, it was a hujja. But this is not our kalam in any case. But dreams have its place. And it's a science. It's a knowledge, a divine knowledge granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we come back to our bahath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces Nabi Yusuf through this khususiyya, through this speciality which was that Nabi Yusuf was given the knowledge by Allah to interpret dreams. Where is the knowledge of Nabi Yusuf? And where is the knowledge of Imam al Qadim? Look at with look, Allah introduces Nabi Yusuf by saying that his speciality he has knowledge of interpretation of dreams. But look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran when it comes to the knowledge or introducing Ahlul Bayt, Surah Al Yaseen. Insha'Allah, all of you read it on a regular basis and on Thursday nights. We are the ones who give life and death and we record everything that you have done in your life. 
and the traces of everything that you have left behind. Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Wa kulla shayin ahshaynahu fi Imam Mubin." Refer back to the books of the Amma. Yanabi ul Mawadda by Hafid Sulaiman al Kunduzi, who is a Hanafi. He mentions this hadith that when this verse of the Quran was revealed, people said to Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, and what is Imam Mubin? Is it the Taurat? He said no. Is it the Injil? He said no. They said, Is it the Quran? He said no. He said, Who is this hadith from the Amma says that Imam Mubin is none other than Mawlana Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. For this is the maqam of Ahlul Bayt. When Allah is introducing Nabi Yusuf to the entire Muslim world, to the entire Alam, Allah introduces Yusuf by saying that we have given him ilm of the interpretation of dreams, a particular type of ilm, a special part of ilm, one type of ilm. But when it comes to introducing the ilm of Ahlul Bayt, Allah says, Wa shayin fi Imam Mubi. The ilm of everything and anything that was in the generations of the past and the generations to come is in the heart of Amir al Mu'mineen and the successor of this Amir al Mu'mineen, the warith of the ilm of Ali ibn Abi Talib is Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al Qadim salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. I buy the ilm of Nabi Yusuf, the ilm of Imam al Qadim. Allah. Where is the superiority of Imam al Qadim in comparison to the superiority of Nabi Yusuf? Darajat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has purified people according to Darajat. This is the frame through which you and I need to understand Ahlul Bayt. You find from the ilm of Imam al Qadim, and perhaps we are out of time. I mentioned this before we go into Masa'ib. We have two nights, inshallah. So what we don't finish tonight, inshallah, tomorrow. Let me mention this before we go into the Na'i. Ilm of Imam al-Qadim. At one time, during the time of his father, Abi Abdullah alayhi salam, Imam al-Sadiq, Abu Hanifa came into the house of Imam al-Sadiq in Medina. And what seems apparent is that he was waiting for Imam al-Sadiq such that he could sit with the Imam and have a dialogue with him. As he was waiting for the Imam, and again what is apparent is that the Imam was busy. As Abu Hanifa was waiting, he says himself, I saw a small child come in to the main room. You could say Gurfatul Istikbal, like a reception area or the front part of the house, which I don't know, living room, sitting room, whatever you want to call it, where all the guests gather together. He says, I was waiting there and I saw from inside of the rooms a young boy come out, who seemed to be a young boy, not more than the age of 10. This happened to be none other than Babul Hawaij Imam al Qadim. He says, I looked at this boy, Abu Hanifa. He says, I said, who is this person? As they said to me, this is the son of Abi Abdullah as Sadiq. Abu Hanifa says, I said to myself, they claim that they have ilm even from a young age. So it's a matter of istihza or ihana or whatever you want to call it. You know when you have a person who picks on somebody who's smaller than him or younger than him, talks a lot about his butulat, yes or no? Abu Hanifa, fully grown man. He says to the child, let me ask you a question. Who is this child who seems to be in the form of a child? Imam Al-Qadim. He says to him, let me ask you a question. A young boy, where does the sin emanate from? 
when it comes to the issue of committing sins, who commits the sins? Is it us human beings who commit sins out of our free will? Or is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who makes us sin? Because we say, or they used to say, and this was, uh -huh, Tara, this was a bahath that was kullish muhim at that time. The issue of jabr and tafweed, predestination and free will. Do you have free will in its entirety over your actions or not? If you say you have free will, does that mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not all powerful and does not have control over you? This was a debate that had ideological implications to great extent that you dumbir ruins the aqidah, the ideology and the life of people if they don't understand jabbar and tafweed. Huh? Till today, ila yawmina hadha. There are certain people, again, bain al Qawsain, I know I'm going over time. Inshallah, Friday night, Saturday, you guys are all chilling. So if I'm five, ten minutes over, inshallah, I will appreciate uh, your cooperation. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> this issue of Jabbar and Tafweed, subconsciously till today it affects us, huh? Because you will always find that there is this group of people or individuals and inshallah none of you are from them. Baba, anything negative that happens in life, they say it was from Allah Azza wa Jalla willed that I should be like this. Baba, you're unemployed, you don't have a good job, it was the will of Allah. Anything bad happens, it was the will of Allah. And it is as if we forget, yes, it is a command eventually, essentially, anything that Allah wants will happen. But what is matloob from our side is that we have effort. I cannot say I am entrenched in poverty because Allah wanted and I don't come out of the house or I don't work hard or I don't put effort. Baba, work hard, put effort and then leave the result to Allah. If the result doesn't come today, it will come tomorrow. It's in the hands of Allah. But don't, don't ever hesitate when it comes to putting effort. Hard work. Being active, being motivated. So the guy, and you have so many of these stories. The guy who made the light bulb, 100 times the guy failed before he made the light bulb. Does it mean that those 100 times were wasted? No, each one was a tajruba leading to the last one. For we have this disease, you find this even within the Muslim ummah. They justify their own sorry state. And they justify laziness and lack of hard work by saying, oh, it's up to Allah. Shunu up to Allah. This is from the teachings of those people who are from the Jabriya and in my opinion this issue of Jabriya is even deeper it was initiated by the time of Bani Umayyah but this is for us another lecture inshallah I remember even as recent as 2002 when I was pursuing university studies inside of Canada there was a course that we were studying and it was called international management part of international management there was a chapter or a section of a course called cross-cultural management. Cross-cultural management, Yani, if you ever happen to work in a corporation, which is a multinational corporation, and you have to work in different companies or different branches in different parts of the world, you got to know how the customs are of that part of the world. I remember in one of the courses I've taken in university, this back in the day, 2001, 2002, inside this book, taught in a university inside of Ottawa, in Canada, Ya Habibi, by a non-Muslim who knows nothing about nothing in Islam, who his job is to make sure that people graduate in business management. And I remember clearly till today, that they had this section business in the Middle East. And the expression was that people in the Middle East are very laid back. And do not take, listen to this, huh? who do not take contract negotiations seriously because they are averse to calculating risk. Ajib. Huh? Do you have a businessman who is averse to calculating risk? At the end of the statement, it says, and this is due to their religious belief that everything is in the hands of God. So economically, whether your signing is a disaster or not in the shufu. Karitha. We need to show a different level of Islam. In any case, for Abu Hanifa comes, our story at Imam Al-Qadim. Ilm of Nabi Yusuf and the Ilm of Imam Al-Qadim. 
Abu Hanifa says, who does the sin emanate from? From Allah, from the slave, from who? Imam Al-Qadim says to the man, oh man, to Abu Hanifa, with the question that you have asked, there are three logical probabilities for which there is no fourth. Look at the answer of this Imam who is 10 years old. He says, there are three possibilities of which there is logically no fourth. The first possibility is that Allah commits the sins. The second possibility is that Allah and the human beings, both of them are partners and bo both of them are basically partners in crime. They both have a share in performing the sin. And the third option is that the human being himself is solely responsible for the sins and the actions that he performs. Imam al-Qadim goes on to say, if it is the first case, yani Allah is responsible for committing sins, then that would mean if Allah is responsible for making you to commit sins, then it is more logical and makes more sense that Allah should be punished in Jahannam. Does it make sense that Allah makes you do the sin and then punishes you? Law, that would make Allah zalim, it would make him unjust, it would make him a tyrant. So that option is out. He says again, the second possibility, if a sin emanates partly from you and partly from Allah, that means if you are both partners in crime, then both of you should end up in Jahannam. And the one who punishes you, even though he was a partner in your sin, also comes back to the first point of injustice. He said that possibility is out unless you submit that God is unjust. Do you find the Muslim in this day and age who says Allah is unjust? And from here was remaining one last probability. That if a sin is committed, it is from the pure free will of the human being. Yes, circumstances can force him, but not that Allah forces him. Nukat in history, ya ahibai, the leader of one of the biggest Islamic madhabs, the Hanafi sect, the teacher of this, the founder, muassis of this madhab Hanafi, was taking dars aqaidi from Imam al Qadim while he was still at the age of 10. We're not talking from a sectarian perspective, but from a perspective of fakhr. This is your Imam al Qadim who you have come to gather and mourn today. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Insha'Allah, a continuation of this bahath, insha'Allah, tomorrow will more tarkiz on the imprisonment of Imam al Qadim and compare it to the imprisonment of Nabi Yusuf. Na'i. <coughs> The life of Imam al Qadim ya ahibai, was a life of pain and a life of grief. And we've got three nights to discuss the tragedy of Imam al Qadim. Tonight and tomorrow night will take certain parts of this tragedy. And the last night, you'll be blessed to recite, or you'll be blessed to be in the presence of the recitation of the Maktal by Samahat Mullah. So, one of the most painful advents and ordeals from all the tribulations of Imam al Qadim, they reached one point of persecution in the jails in the prison. Huh? You know, the prison of Imam al Qadim, as we'll say tomorrow, he was moved from multiple prisons. And in one of these prisons, it was a Tamura. It was a an underground hole dug, a hole dug within an underground dungeon where you are not able to tell the difference between day and night. The persecution reached to an extent where Imam al Qadim recites a supplication Ya Mukhallis al Shajara minateen wal ramil wal mai. He goes on and on and on. O oh, you who separated and removed the tree from the seed in the earth and the water. Khallisni min bayna yaday Harun. Imam al Qadim pleads to Allah and says, I beg you to free me from the prison of Harun.
Why would the Imam who is al kadhim the patient of all patient ones, even say such a thing? Could he not handle the persecution? Could he not handle the imprisonment physically? Abadan la, there was something much more greater than this. And he himself narrates that at one time when I was inside this underground dungeon, the hole in the underground dungeon, he says that I was getting suffocated. Imam al kadhim says, I was getting suffocated because of, the, because of the tightness of the place, the constraints of the place. I could not breathe. Imam al kadhim says that I pulled myself up to the top of the tamura, to the ground level, just so that I can take a gasp of fresh air, just so that I can breathe and not die of being clustered inside of the ground. Imam al kadhim says that when I put my head up towards the opening, there was one of the prison guards who was standing there. As soon as I put my head up, this prison guard kicked me across my chest. Allahu Akbar. He says, my Imam al kadhim says, it was not the kick on the chest that hurt me. Ya Bab al Hawaij, what was it? Imam al kadhim says, in order to hurt me even more Shatamu Ummi Fatima he says they would curse and they would abuse my mother Fatima Allahu Akbar I know Sada are sitting here forgive me this is your grandmother Fatima Zahra it hurts you that I even say somebody insulted Fatima can you even imagine those rogue and vulgar language that was used while Imam al Qadim is listening Imam Imam al kadhim would cry and weep and he had a special connection and a bond with Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. Imam al kadhim and Sayyidah al-Zahra, the narrations mention that before his imprisonment in Medina, Imam al kadhim would spend numerous nights crying on the grave of Fatima, weeping over the tragedy of Fatima, for indeed had Fatima not been assaulted, then the situation would not be this for Imam al kadhim Where did Imam al kadhim sit? Where is the grave of Fatima? I don't know. Don't ask me. This is from the Wasiya of Zahra. Imam al kadhim mentions to us one of the tragedies of Sayyidah Zahra. The narrations mention that upon the martyrdom of Rasul Allah, the party of Iblis went towards the house of Amir al muminin and the house of Fatima they began to bang the door of Fatima violently when she refused them entry. The hadith mentions that the Fir'aun of the Ummah lit the door of Fatima on fire. Fatima Zahra says they lit the door on fire and then he kicked open the door. Zahra says I got crushed between the door and the wall. I fell down to the ground. Fatima, Fatima says I was choking from the smokes and the flames of the burning door. The narrations mention that when he entered inside, he slapped Zahra across the cheek. Wa Fatima! He, he, he slapped her across the cheek. The earring of Fatima broke. She cried out in the most painful voices. Wa Abata! He says that when I heard her cry out, Ya Rasulullah, he says, I kicked her in the stomach with all the strength that I had, and she cried out, Wa Muhsina. Imam al kadhim says, Imam al kadhim says that when they tied the rope of Amirul, when they tied the rope around the neck of Amirul Mu'mineen, Fatima went running behind Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam al kadhim says at this point, Marwan ibn Hakam turned around and he slapped my mother fought <laughs> Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah We pray to Allah Azza wa Jal by the sake of Babu al-Hawa'ij Imam Musa ibn Jafar al-Kadhim Allahumma ajjil li waliyyina al-Faraj 
We pray to Allah by the sake of Babu al-Hawaij, Imam al-Qadim, to high hast in the reappearance of Imam al-Hujjah. By the sake of Imam al-Qadim, Ya Allah, make us to be deserving from amongst the Ashab and the Ansar of Imam al-Hujjah. By the sake of Babu al-Hawaij, Imam al-Qadim, Ya Allah, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat who have come here today to honor the majlis of Imam al-Qadim, do not let anybody leave except that you have fulfilled all their desires and their supplications, Ya Allah. Mu'mineen and Mu'minat who are not in the best of health, by the sake of Babu al-Hawaij, Imam al-Qadim, Ya Allah, you cure them from all type of sicknesses and ailments. All of our marhumin and marhumat, mu'minin and mu'minat who have passed away by the sake of Babu al-Hawaij, Imam al-Qadim, Ya Allah, you make their graves into a garden from the gardens of Jannah. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, yakulu Allah ta'ala, inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima.